Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Let's start some prayer, would you? Let's pray, guys. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, this time to come together and look at your word, and we pray now that just as that breeze is coming in off the ocean, Lord, you would send a blowing of your Holy Spirit to refresh us, to encourage us, help us draw near to you, and uh, to give us strength and encouragement, keep the distractions away from us, Lord, that we can keep our eyes fixed on you. We ask now that you use Pastor Izzy to encourage each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. We're going to finish up. We have one paragraph left of Romans 13 this morning, and we're jump into chapter 14 then, and one of my favorite passages of Scripture for uh, one of the most reoccurring questions I get from uh, especially Christians starting out in their Christian faith, questions about how do I know what is allowed to do? How do I know, you know, like with God, I want to be right with Him, but, you know, I don't know the rules kind of thing. And I want to show you about what the scripture teaches, about the rules, because it says the kingdom of God is not a bunch of rules, not, uh, not about meat or drink, what we eat, what we, how we, you know, all these things that people, some, some, for some reason, make, they, they make a, a religious, or I shouldn't even use the word, I hate the word religion, I'm anti-religion if you haven't figured that out. I looked it up in Webster's, it says religion is man's attempt to get to God. And when I read the Bible, it teaches about God's attempt to get to man. And that's a relationship, not a religion. He, he is pro-relationship with his creation. And so he went to a lot of trouble to have it where we could communicate, communicate and connect with him and sent his son to, to repair the breach of our sin. So Christ did all that work for us, and we are invited into this sweet relationship now that we get to call God Abba in the, in the Hebrew. Abba means um, it's Hebrew for daddy. It would be dada, actually, is what it is. It's, uh, it's very, you know, intimate. It's not, it's not like father in, a, in a, like a real, you know, important sense. It's, it's dada, you know, my dad. I get to call dad. And for some, this is one of the sweetest things about the, my Christian faith that I get to share, especially with folks that feel like they didn't have an earthly father. Maybe the earthly father was gone. Maybe he died in the war. You know, I grew up in a military family, had a lot of friends that their dads weren't there. And there just was an emptiness, you know, that, that, that dad wasn't there. But we have a heavenly dad, our God, who cares about us. And he has some things that he gave to Paul the apostle to speak to the church at Rome. And they, and they really help in this day. I found out, well, let me just show you what he says. At the end of chapter 13, he tells us, do, verse 11, I'm sorry, Romans 13, 11. He says, do this, knowing the time that it's already near. For the hour, it says, to awake, is, it says, for the hour to awaken from sleep, he says, is, is now. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. He says, the night is almost gone, the day is near. Let us therefore lay aside deeds of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us behave as in the day, not, not as in the night in, uh, with carousings and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity, not in sensuality, not in strife, not in jealousy, but instead put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, make no provisions for the flesh in regard to its lusts. You know, Paul, it's ironic to me, he could have been writing this about today. That, you know, I mean, was, he was saying this back thousands of years ago that the time is already near. That, and, and the time to live after the flesh, he says, that's all, we've already had enough. Literally, we've had enough time to do all the stuff in the flesh, you know, all the carousings and the sensual stuff. He says, don't even give, don't even give it the opportunity, the flesh. It's time to live in the spirit. Now, in another place, Paul writes, if you walk by the spirit... You overcome the deeds of the flesh. And man, there's sometimes those deeds of the flesh that we do, those sensual things and the, and the promise, the lying, the cheating, those things come back to, to haunt us. 
And so Paul's trying to show these guys a better way, how to live after the Spirit. And he says, you, gotta, you have to literally make no provision for the flesh. You've got to just go, I'm not, I'm not going to make that the, uh, the focus of my day. I'm going to make the focus of my day walking after the Lord. Now, chapter 14, he goes into one of the stumblings that happens, and I don't know why, but a lot of the cults, is the best word I can use. The false religions make a great emphasis about what we do on the outside. What people can see. What we eat, what we drink, what we, how we dress. You know, like big deal. You know, and I, I was part of one church that, that, man, if you didn't wear a white shirt and a tie and a, and a jacket, I mean, a sport, you know, like a uh, suit jacket, suit, suit coat, then you weren't even holy enough to come in. Because only holy people could come in their church, and only holy people, of course, wore a suit, you know, full suit and everything. And, and I read the scripture, and I never see anywhere where Jesus wore a suit. And I never see anywhere where Jesus made an issue about what you dressed in. He was always talking about the inside, the, the heart, right? He, he never got on to people about the, the clothing on the outside. He was... He was the one that was the, the, the great physician that dealt with the issues on the inside, what was in the heart. In fact, he, ch he chastised the religious guys. He said, you guys, you're like whitewashed tombs, whitewashed sepulchers. You're, 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 you're that's a nice compliment, isn't it? <laughs> a sepulcher, that's like, you know, one of them stone things where they put the, the, bo the dead bones of the person in there and seal it up and... And he, said, and he says, you guys are like the ones that they, and they paint white on the outside. This is a tomb. He said, but that's how these religious leaders were to Jesus. He said, you're, you're on the outside, you're all pretty and white, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Death inside. And so Paul had to deal with this. And by the way, he doesn't just have to deal with this at the church at Rome. When you read the book of Corinthians, the next letters in the, in the Bible that follow the book of Romans, you got first and second Corinthians, he's got to write both times about this, I this issue. Then he has to write to the church at Galatia some more things about this. Not, not walking by the flesh. Walk by the spirit. And one of the most fleshly things that for some reason the cults do is make an issue of, well, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. Well, do you eat meat? Are you vegan? Are you vegetarian? There, there's classes now, not just... When I was a kid, you're either a vegetarian or you're a meat eater, carnivore, right? There's only two groups. They've, they've complicated it now. You know, you can be gluten intolerant, but you can be, or wheat intolerant, or you can be, you know, they got broken down. Lactose, or you do eat lactose? Do you eat soy? Are you a bean eater? Are you, I mean, <laughs> all right. Does this, does this somehow make me more approved by God what I eat or what I don't eat? Look at what Paul says here. Chapter 14. This is the place if someone asks you, uh, you know, they're very into making their spiritual experience um, a visceral eating experience. Tell them, you know, you should probably refer to Romans 14. Because this is what the Bible teaches. It says, now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he could eat all things. Another one, well, he who's weak, it says, eats vegetables only. Now, the one who, I, I, who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. So if you're a person who has faith to eat meat and, and all sorts of stuff, and you meet a vegetarian, are you supposed to, are you supposed to diss them because they're, oh, you stupid, weak faith person? You, you're supposed to pass judgment, right? No. no. Jesus said, don't judge anybody. Judge not, what will happen if you judge? Judge not lest you be judged, judged it says in Matthew 7. I don't, I don't know about you. Anyone here want to volunteer for extra judgment? No thank, you. no, thank you. I mean, I need that like a hole in the head. Just best thing you can do is we're not here to judge another brother. And this is what Paul goes on to say. He says here, the person who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, verse 3. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who does eat. For God has accepted them both. And it says, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand. 
for the Lord is able to make him stand. You know, to, to God, it doesn't matter if they eat vegetables or meat. It doesn't, it's the Lord that makes us able to stand in this life. And that's, the, that's where our strength comes from, right? It's from the Lord. Now he says one person, one person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person, he said, must be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, he who observes the day, well, he observes it for the Lord. And he who eats, he does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. He who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. Notice they're both giving thanks to God, whether they eat or they don't eat, or whether they worship on one day of the week or another day. There's a whole sect that they only worship on a certain day of the week. And if you don't worship on their day, you're, 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 you're taking the mark of the beast. You're, you're terrible. I don't know why they don't read the scripture. The scripture says, let each person ha be convinced in their own mind. You know, you could, I'm just going to tell you this from the standpoint of being in the ministry for 35 years. I work Sundays. You know. <laughs> and some of you are like, that's my day of rest, Pastor. I said, praise the Lord. But it's not really a day of rest for us. Probably one of the heaviest days, you know, it's the, it's the, the heavy day of the week. So, so you know what, I re I, I, but I need, I have learned, see, I don't use the idea of having a day of rest, a Sabbath, as a punishment. I mean, I know when I was younger, I was like, you mean you're not supposed to do anything for a whole day? I'm going to go, I, you don't understand, man, I'm one of those kids, I'm fidgety, I got to do something all the time, and you tell me to hold still? You know that Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. I'm like, I'm being punished. I have to be... St no, I looked it up in Greek and in Hebrew. It says the, the word is to cease striving. That's the difference than being still. Cease striving. In other words, quit trying to make it happen in your own strength. Make it in your own... You know what I mean? When you strive to get something done, it says let it go. Do you know that you need a whole day of letting it go just to reset your... Right? I mean, some people don't... They don't believe me. I say, go ahead, do it for th three weeks in a row, not a day off. Just keep it up. You're going to crash. Four weeks? Oh, you've gone on a month without a day of rest. You're going to owe back. Just watch. You're going to get sick, and you'll be five days in bed, a week in bed. You know, every time we think we can outsmart God, the one who, our creator, says, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. You know, it's in the Ten Commandments. Why should we remember to take a day of rest and honor God? Because God made us and he knows, buddy, you can't do it without taking a day of rest. Now, I'm only saying this from personal experience. I have tried to go without a day of rest or to go without times of refreshment. You know, like in the good Jews, they would, they would every single Sabbath, they take no work. This is a day off. And every holy day, uh, the 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 the. Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Passover, the Tabernacles, all of their feasts, Yom Kippur, they take whole weeks off at a time. No work. If you're a good Jew, I've shared this before, if you really follow the Jewish w tradition, you, do you know that you take one-third of your year off? One-third. You add up all those, you know, you get 52 s Sabbaths plus the, the Holy Weeks, you put it all together, they get a whole, they only work two-thirds of the year. And some people think God's uptight. Because, I mean, how would you like it if you went to your job interview and the boss says, well, listen, I'd like to hire you. I'm going to pay you a full year salary, but you're only allowed to work for two-thirds of the year. What would you think of that boss if they really did that? Would you be going, sign me up, man. Where'd you get that guy? <laughs> you got the best boss in the world. Well, that's my boss. But see, I can't, I'm working Sunday. So what day do I rest? Monday. I take Monday. Now, this verse right here says, one man regards one day above another, another man regards every day alike, but let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. You know, I, I had to realize it wasn't a punishment to take a day off. It was a privilege. As you get older, you appreciate it more. You know, when you get older, you're like, oh, whew, day off. Oh, thanks. I need, I, I got to recharge the battery. You know, it's like you, you don't mind a day off. You don't mind stopping striving and just l putting it. You know, on the Sabbath, you're supposed to take your cares and give them to the Lord and say, Lord, you take care of it. You take care of me. 
I'm not going to make it happen for me. I'm going to let you be my God, my provider. Jehovah Jireh, it says in the Hebrew. God, my provider. You take care of me. Now, God promises if you honor him, he'll take care of you. It's a, it's a, in, I know we wrestle with this in our culture because we're just workaholics. But <laughs> do any of you have Jewish friends or are you acquainted with some Jewish folks? How do they, uh, as a whole, general, how do most Jewish folks do on the financial picture? Are they suffering? And no. no, man. They're, one of the, they're leading in the, in the wealth of this world. They're like the wealthiest folks as a people group, and yet they only work two-thirds of the year. I'm thinking I'm doing something wrong. You know, I'm, I'm trying to repent of that this year. I'm going to start every Monday, don't call me. I'm off. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad. <laughs> you know, like, no, no, it says, and this is another part I had to learn. It, Jesus said it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You know, when, when we think day off, sometimes we, we, we think of it all about ourselves. That's my day off, man. Don't, don't bother me. I'm going to just vegetable out. I'll, tur I'll turn on the television. I'll just, you know... And the, and, the, and the Lord, you know, to, to the Pharisees, they, they were testing Jesus. It's a Sabbath. You're not allowed to do any work. And they, do you know that they put a guy with a withered hand in the front row in the temple? And they called on Jesus. Would you like to do the reading of the scripture? And they knew it was a test. They were going to make Jesus walk past the guy in the front seat. And they're like, he, he can't leave it alone. You know, because he's so compassionate. He's, you know, Jesus, right? What's he going to do? The guy's got his hand all withered up and he's right there in the front. And here's Jesus coming up to read. And so Jesus stops and he says to the fellow, he says, stretch forth your hand. Now, this guy had a withered hand from birth. You know, just think of someone that was born with a, their, their hand just, you know, small and withered up and their whole life they've had this. If they could stretch forth their hand, they would have done it already. So Jesus is really telling the guy to do something impossible. But, oh, guess what day of the week this is? I forgot to mention. Did I tell you? It was a Sabbath. So the guy stretches forth his hand, and he's healed right in the service. Now, if that happened for us, someone came, they're in a wheelchair, they never walked, or they, their arm was withered up, and, 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 and the Lord just touched them in our service. What would we say? Oh, that's terrible. You shouldn't do that at our church at this time. This is the Sabbath. Don't do that on the Sabbath. That's working. I mean, I'd be rejoicing. I don't know about you. I'd be like, oh, right, Lord, way to go. You know, but they actually wanted to kick Jesus out because they said he was working. I mean, how much work was it anyway? Stretch forth thine hand. In English, it's only four words. Go ahead. Put, that was work? But they viewed it as work. And they said, you could come any other day of the week and do this, but you came, you shouldn't be doing it on this day. But they set it up to try to trap him. And their mind was not correct. Because Jesus said, have you not read the law? If an ox falls into a well on a Sabbath, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but ox are not small. If an ox fell into a well, it says you are allowed to pull the ox from the well on the Sabbath day. That's going to be a fun job. <laughs> like pulling a car out of a ditch. You know, worse. It's alive, kicking. You're going to pull an ox out of a well, and that's allowed. But you can't say, stretch forth your hand. Somebody's not correct in the mind. And Jesus told them, you lost the picture. It is lawful to do well on the Sabbath. And it might even inquire, require work. I might be on my day off and driving and someone's broke down and the Holy Spirit says, stop and help them. And it might take a lot of work to help them. But is it a lawful thing to do good on the Sabbath? Yes. yes. Always remember that. The spirit of the law is what we're, in, what we're focusing on, not the letter. Because by the letter of the law, many good Christians have been 
stomped down instead of raised up. Let me show you what Paul goes on to say. He says this. He says, both guys, whether they eat or they drink or they don't eat, they don't drink, whatever day they observe, they do it for the Lord. So they give thanks to God either way. Verse 7 says, for not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we're the Lord's. Let's get the focus here. Are we the Lord's or not? And then he says, for to this end, Christ, Christ died. And he lived again that he might be both the, the Lord of both the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? It says, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Just as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess. They'll give praise to God. This is Isaiah 46, by the way. Around verse 22, 23 there. The, Isaiah said this. Every knee is going to bow to God. What, why are you judging? It's, it's God we have to stand before. In verse 12, he says, So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. An account of who? Ourselves. Yourself. Not your spouse, not your boss, not the person you're judging. You only get to give an account of you before God. We've got to keep the perspective. We're going to stand before the Lord. Therefore, now Paul is great at, because this is true, we all have to stand before our maker. And we're only going to stand there, and I'm not going to be able to go, but God, didn't you see what Barnabas did? And he did that. D is that going to fly? You, you know, I'm, I'm only pointing this out because I don't know if it's just a sibling thing, but whenever one sibling gets in trouble, but mom, what about, right? Always one, what about the other one? And, and, and she did this and, you know, get your sister in trouble. Get your brother in trouble. We, we, by the way, God is our father, but sometimes we pull the same little maneuver we do down here on earth with our earthly parents with our heavenly one. Oh, but God, what about them? And God's going, what about you? I'm the, you know, this is the part where it's a personal relationship between us and our maker. And we're too busy trying to skirt out of the, out of the spot we're supposed to stay in. Us to him, direct, not, what about them? Don't forget judging them. God will, this is what Paul's saying. God is the one who will judge. And he says, and by the way, I, I do need to point this out. It says, so that each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, to put no obstacle, no stumbling block in a brother's way. Let's make this our determination to not stumble. You know, it really stumbles people when you judge them. I don't know if you realize it, but if you start, if you're a really critical person and you're always judging people, it stumbles people. To be honest, I, I don't think you're very fun to be around. Anyone like those kind of people that are always judging you? You, know, you go around and you just feel like they're just judge, they judge you about everything. You part your hair on the wrong side. I don't part my hair. Well, yeah, but, you know, <sighs> your hair's too short. It's too long. You dress funny. What? <laughs> I'm going to pull my hair out with these people. What is it with people that, that they, they think that that's the... But see, Paul is saying, when you judge other people, you're, you're stumbling them. You're putting a stumbling block in their lives. And he says, let's determine... This takes determination, by the way. But how about if I got everyone here... I'm, I'm going to just do a test run for just this week, because I know some of you, if I said do this forever, you'd be like, I can't do it. So let's just start off baby steps. One week, this week, you determine with me that we don't judge anybody. We leave judgment in the hands of the only qualified person to judge, God. Let him be the judge. Let him do his job. And we determine not to stumble our brothers. 
We're not here to judge one another. You know, I don't know about you, but have you ever had someone in your life that loved you unconditionally? Maybe two, two, uh, you know, in our, our culture we say Nona. My grandmother. My grandmother loved us with this unconditional love. We just felt love. didn't matter. You know, we did something wrong. We, we broke the plate. We did whatever. And she loved us anyway. There was no condition for her love. Any one of you have someone like that in your life? How do you feel when you're around those people? Happy, right? It's like, it, it, you feel like you can be yourself. It's freeing. It, it really is. It's like, like a weight off your shoulders. You're like, I don't have to act all perfect. I don't have to do everything. I just got to just be the work. The, we're studying this on Tuesday night in Philippians. That God who began a good work in us is what? Faithful to complete it. And that we're all works in progress. When you have someone who is, loves you unconditionally, you know, they don't judge you, and they recognize we're all works in progress, they're, they're like a pleasure to be around. Something about when you're around those kind of people, you're just like, oh, I, can, I can breathe. I don't know about you, but it, it's like a breath of fresh air. Because if you're ever around the ones that are always judging you, always pointing the finger, always picking, pick, 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 they wear you out. I mean, they just like suck you dry. I call them psychic vampires, you know? And they come around just like, whoa. It's just, it's, just, it's just a drain. So would you do this with me for one week? Let's determine not to stumble anyone. And the way we do that is we don't judge anyone. We don't worry about being the judge. We have to remember who's the judge. Who are we going to stand before and give an account? God. So for one week, let's let God, will determine God is God. Only one qualified to judge anyway. And let's let him do the judging. And let's do what the scripture says. Mercy resists judgment. Or another translation says mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's just show mercy to people this week. Mercy is, by the way... It's, it's not something you, you earn. It's something you, you get because of the, the giver of it. You, you just go, look, man, we're all works in progress. It's okay. Let's just keep going. You might find that the people this week around you might be more happy to see you when you come. Because if you are a judgmental soul, and I hate to tell you this, but they're out there, and how they infiltrate the church, I don't know, but they sure do. And they show up, and they start judging everyone. Well, that guy, he didn't dress properly. And that guy over there, he wasn't, you know. And like, look, guys. There's a church on the beach. You know, I've shared this before, but I got to tell you, we're not supposed to stumble. Jesus took this very serious. He said, if you stumble even a little one, he says, it's better that you get this piece of jewelry called a millstone necklace. Now, I don't know if you know what a millstone is. A millstone is that big, like 6,000 to 10,000 pound stone, has this big post in the middle, and it has a little hole drilled through it, and it, it sits on this stone platform, and they drop the, they, they hook a, an ox or a donkey, a, a beast of burden, something with strong muscles to it, and they push it in a circle. And it, and, and it causes the big millstone to grind against the, just by sheer weight, to press against the stone that it, that it rubs on. And they drop the, through the hole, they drop the grain, the wheat, down through the hole. And as it slips underneath the, the stone, as it's being mashed and turned, out comes out of the edge, that the, the, the grain that went in comes out as crushed flour from the millstone. Jesus said, it'd be better if you get one of those millstones and like a puka shell necklace, just put that on, you only need one, because they're a little bit big. Tie it around your neck and then go swimming in the deepest trench of the sea. And the feeling of that millstone dragging you to the depths of the ocean is better for you than if you stumble the least of my brethren, even a little child. Now, if you ask me, Jesus took this very seriously. By the way, do you know that millstone story is in three of the Gospels? Not just one. I mean, this is so important that three of the gospel writers put it in their gospels to tell us, make sure you don't stumble your brother. 
Because Jesus takes it very serious. He says, it's better for you to, to make a millstone necklace. Now, if you want to know what this is, this is in Matthew 18, verse 6. Mark tells us it in chapter 9, verse 42. And Luke tells us it in Luke 17, verse 2. For my note takers, they like to know where these things are. But all three of those gospels tell us the account of Jesus saying, don't stumble your brother. Don't do it. Now, if, if it's that important that he would say that, should I determine for a week to not stumble anyone? To not be the judge? I mean, because this is how you stumble them. You judge them. And you judging, you passing judgment. Yeah, I always ask people, since when did you get qualified to do God's job? Last time I checked, I'm not qualified. I mean, I'm part of his creation. I ain't the creator. I'm just the creation. And I don't, I don't have his attributes that I could even be qualified to judge. But why do we feel so compelled to do it for God? Like, like he needs help? What, he's not big enough to do his job? He doesn't know how to judge rightly and perfectly? And the Bible tells us God does this perfectly. And God does it, thankfully, with grace and with mercy. Because if he didn't, man, we'd be toast. Everyone, we'd be toasted. If it wasn't for the grace of God, how would we make it? But this is the accountability doctrine that is not very popular to teach in American culture. The American culture wants me to teach, get an accountability partner to help you in your Christian journey. Brother, I'm going to be accountable to you. You be accountable to me. We'll keep each other in line. That's such a bunch of hogwash. Because I can always put on a good face when you come around. How are you doing today? Oh, great, brother. Thanks for asking. How about you? I'll spin it real quick. I could be doing terrible. I don't tell you. See, but can I spin to God that, that lie? No. And so the accountability doctrine to men has caused great fall in the body of Christ. It sounds really ear tickling. It sounds really good. You know, when it first started coming out a couple decades ago, I, I started mentioning, excuse me, I see a snare here. And they're like, what? I said, I can't find any verse that says we're accountable to one another like this. I can see where it says to encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, I, could, I could make a case for encouragement partners. Anyone want an encouragement partner? You need to encourage, that you encourage each other? Day after, that I could get behind. But that I'm accountable to you is a, is a scary, scary perversion of the scripture. Because really the one I have to give an answer to, I'm not worried about men. What does it say? Who do I stand before on judgment day? God. If I teach the young ones, you're going to have to give an answer to God for everything you do. Not for uh, what everyone else does, for what you do. That's a, that's a healthy thing for us to know. How many of you grew up being taught that? I, I don't know why, but a couple decades ago, this was common knowledge. That we all would stand before God one day. I mean, it wasn't like a mystery. But for some reason, over the last couple decades, I don't know if it was the whole get the Bible out of school thing and get rid of God in the school. So we have a whole generation that doesn't, they, don't, they didn't come up with this knowledge that you're going to someday have to answer to God. And because of it, they kind of, like, almost like they, f they flail. They don't know, like, well, who, you know, who's really the, who makes the morals? I mean, who, what kind of rules are, I mean, how do I know? And I don't even know if there is anyone we're going to answer to. And to me, that just, it, it, it makes my heart sink because, when you know you're going to answer to God for everything you do, does it shape how you behave? Sure. Does it shape your character? Of course. And if I spin it that you've got to answer to a man, <laughs> every time I looked at authorities that I was supposed to answer to, yeah, I could, I could, you know, straighten up and march straight when they were around. But it's kind of like, it's kind of like doing the job when the boss is in there. But when the boss leaves, you throw the broom down, you know. Fool around. 
talk story, do whatever. I mean, you, because he's gone, right? When it comes to, to being accountable to men, we, we got it down to an art form. We see the boss coming, pick up the room. Oh, look busy. Hey, boss, been working really hard. Glad you're back. You know, he left, we were over in that corner, and we moved about two feet. But when it comes to being accountable to men, we, we, it's, it's, a, it's a short sale. It, it keeps you from really living truthfully. Because you, you know you can, you can fudge. <laughs> but you can't fudge with God. You cannot. He's always on the job. He always sees everything. And I'd rather teach this next generation that we have a God who sees everything and is there for you all the time. And he's the one that will back your act because he, you don't even have to strive. Even on your day of rest, you get to just let it go and let him help you. What a privilege. A Sabbath becomes a whole different thing in that understanding. It's a, it's a welcomed day to see what God will do. What will God? I mean, to me, I, every time it's my day off, I, I get excited. I'm like, wonder what God's going to do today. Because he promises he will supply what we need. And it, you know, people say to me, oh, yeah, well, it happens for you, pastor. You know, like, you, like you're special. You work for God. I ain't no special than any of you in the sight of the Lord. The Lord loves us all. And I promise you, he wants to do this for every person here. So let's, let's make it where we do this week, where we say, you know what? I'm going to determine this, not to put a stumbling block in front of my brother. I'm just going to, I'm not going to be their judge. In fact, if they come to you with a problem, the best thing you can say is, listen, we're all works in progress. Just keep Keep seeking the Lord. Keep pressing on. You know, keep up the good fight. Just hang in there. I mean, how would you feel if someone actually said that to you? You know, your, your, your co-worker, your boss, just don't worry about it. Just hang in there. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to encourage you. Like the scriptures, Hebrews 3.13, by the way, is that verse. Encourage one another day after day. As long as it is still called today. I call up some of the brethren every once in a while and say, hey, it's still called today. Be of good courage. And I never have them go, wow, that was a bummer call to get from you. I, I've had a lot of them call me back and say, thanks for calling me and telling me that. You, you don't know what I was going through right then. You know, I, a lot of times I get the machine and I used to like just hang up. Now I don't do that. I, I, got, I got over that whole awkwardness of talking to nothing because I know that they're going to listen later so I just lay it down still call today whenever you get this just remember hang in there be of good courage you know How, do you guys remember when Joshua was going to lead the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 1 and 2 the Lord had to speak to Joshua he was taking over for Moses a big hat to, to you know what do you call it? Put in uh, big shoes to fill, you know, when you follow Moses. And, and the Lord had to send an angel to Joshua and say to him, Joshua, do not be afraid. Only be strong, he says, and be of good courage. The Lord is with you. Now you say, well, that's a cool, how'd you like an angel to tell you that? <laughs> hey, don't be afraid. Just, just be strong. Be of good courage. You're going to, the Lord, the Lord is with you. Now, would that be a nice visit? Anyone would volunteer for a visit from an angel telling you that? I mean, worse for me. But do you guys know, uh, how many of you read that first two chapters of Joshua? Do you know that he, the angel repeats it four times in two chapters? Joshua, are you home? Hello? <laughs> the angel has to tell him four times. You look it up. Extra credit. Four times he tells him over and over, only be strong. I mean, now, I don't know if Joshua was compliant, but you don't understand, and there's a lot of people, and Moses did the job, and I'm a, who am I? I'm the understudy, and I don't know. And After all his objections, only be strong and be of good courage. The Lord is with you. Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't tell us all of his objections, but it does tell us the angel's part.
part of the conversation. Thank God for that. It's okay. Only be strong. Be of good courage. The Lord is with you. We, that's a word we need. Now, if you need that word, could you just do, add this to the, to the list this week? Don't judge others. Tell them. Be strong. Be of good courage. Encourage them. The Lord is with you. We've got a whole generation that needs to learn that the Lord is with us. We, we make God this religious experience where he's up there, we're down here, and he's not with us. But when baby Jesus was born, the angel said, Behold, this day is born unto you the Savior of the world. And you shall call his name what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. We need this generation to know God is with us. And it's the best thing you can pass to the next ones by just telling them, look, it's okay. We're works in progress. God is with us. We're going to see him someday. We're going to answer to him someday. Don't worry about others. Don't worry about what they're thinking about you. You know, that sidetrack. When we start worrying about what someone else is thinking about us or how they're, you know, judging us, and it, gets us, it, it really plays with our mind, plays with our emotions. For, for you guys that have experienced where you have someone that's very harsh and judgmental in your life, it can just push you down. But this week, I want us to do what it says here. We determine. With a determination. We have to, de anyone willing to determine with me to do this this week? It means you have to make the decision in your mind, I'm not going to be the judge. I'm just going to be the encourager. Let's do Hebrews 3.13. I love how it says it. As long as today is still called today. Encourage one. Okay, we're on today. Everybody encourage one another. When we get to tomorrow, my day off, you can call me and encourage me. Pastor, it's called today. So when we're on tomorrow, it'll be called today. And guess what we're supposed to do? Encourage one another. Day after day, as long as it is still called today. Man, that's a sneaky way of saying you need to encourage each other every day. I mean, until the Lord comes back, day is going to be called today. Whatever day we're on. That's how much we need encouragement. So let's determine to do this. Let's be the people, when they run into us, they're going, man, I got so encouraged. I ran into that guy who goes to a little church on the beach. They don't even have a building, you know, but they were so encouraging. The church is not about a building. The church is about the people. Jesus said, where two or more gather in my name, there I am in the midst. That's church. Sorry, we don't have the fanciest facility. We got the best wallpaper, though. Don't we? I love our wallpaper. Clean the windows for you guys this morning before you got here. It's, it's, yeah, it's, thank you, Lord, for our wallpaper. Well, let's do this this week. And next week, I, I didn't get as far as I, I'd hoped, but my wife's chuckling over there. I never do. <laughs> next week, I'll go over the rules, the real rules, the ones that are really, I won't, they're not even rules. They're, they're, they're guidelines. They're, they're like gauges that help you know how, what's right, what's wrong, how to know what to do. And it is truly one of the most freeing things to learn. Once you know this, it opens up your whole Christian experience into what it's meant to be. So do me a favor. Read to the end of chapter 14 for me for next week, and uh, we'll pick up, we'll finish off that last paragraph together, and it's a, it's, it, it builds on what we just studied today. So you have to get, you're going to have to do this for a week before I can teach you the next part, the part that really is the icing on the cake. This is the cake part. Next week's the frosting that is going to really make it sweet. You're going to go, wow, this really helps my faith, helps my walk. So we'll, we'll pick up here next week, okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you gave us this instruction from your holy scriptures. And I pray as we go from here today, each one of us would be those, those people that come across others' lives as the encouragement that we, that we could be to them. Lord, give our, our, our minds, our, 
inspiration, Lord, of the words we should say, the, or just the actions. The, maybe you'll want us to do something for our neighbor or cook them a meal or, or just be kind and say hello to them. Lord, help us to follow you in the things what you would have us do. Help us be like your son. Help us to determine not to judge this week, but instead to encourage. And I ask that you would do that for every person here. We would truly be uh, an extension of your hand of grace in our community, Lord. Do that work through us. We pray now in Jesus, your son's precious name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.